become spell weavers, reavers, rogues, and men at arms and answer the call of adventure. Pick up your sword, your axe, your spell book, your bow, your rule book, and your dice, and join the forces of good in their eternal fight against vile monsters, conspiring min maxers, horny bards, and blood soaked murder hobos. Discover the treasure trove of role playing games here on Rollin' Bones. My name is Ryan Howard, and I shall be your guide. Good evening, Boneheads, and welcome to Rollin' Bones with Ryan Howard, your RPG treasure trove. I'm your host and king of the Boneheads, Ryan Howard, and joining us this evening, this is something that I'm very glad we were able to pull together uh, pretty quickly because uh, this man is the founder of Autark. Uh, their game, Ascendant, is currently the top seller on Drive Through RPG, so uh, without further ado, Ladies and gentlemen, uh, please welcome to Rolling Bones, Alexander Macris. Welcome. Hey, thanks for having me on the show. Oh, no problem at all. Thanks for coming on, especially, uh, you know, in light of the uh, the recent success of Ascendant. Well, it's it's uh, it's great to be on the show and great to see the success. I it was unexpected, unanticipated, but very welcome. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, uh, Alex, we're gonna pretty much start the same place we start with everyone on here. Uh, I like to ask everyone the uh, you know same introductory questions to build a little background, and so let's begin at the beginning here. How did you get into uh, RPGs, tabletop RPGs specifically? I was introduced to tabletop RPGs at age 5, 1981, by my older brothers, Willie and Theo, uh, who had started playing the Red Box D&D uh, basic set by Tom Moldvay and they needed another player and so I got given a character I was a thief with strength 7 and I died to a white dragon that was my introduction age 5 um, they then went off to college left me all of their dungeon dragon stuff which I greedily inherited and uh, started running games with my friends and kind of grew from there so I've, I've now been playing uh, dungeon dragons and related role-playing games for 41 years. Sweet. Yeah, now, starting cool. out at five years old, uh, a lot of people would say that's maybe a little on the young side for RPGs. What was that like, uh, you know, being introduced to that game at such a young age? Yeah. So my, my family as a whole was very into science fiction and fantasy and military gotcha. history. Um, my mother actually named uh, my brother William for William the Conqueror. She named me for Alexander the Great. And like when other kids were getting read, like Dr. Seuss, you know, she used to read his Greek mythology, Beowulf, stuff like that. Um, so it never really struck me as strange as a kid. Like it seemed entirely plausible that you would, you know, hang out with your friends and discuss uh, going on quests and killing dragons and things. Um, you know, certainly I was always uh, on the younger side of any group of players, and, and that kind of stayed through. Um, when I was in high school, I used to go to the local community college and run uh, Cyberpunk 2020 for the, um, the college gaming group at uh, Allegheny Community College. And then, you know, when I, was in, uh, when I was in college, as a plebe at West Point, I was running uh, campaigns for the, the upperclassmen. So, uh, I, I don't know. I, I guess I was like a child prodigy of role-playing games. <laughs> kind of a useless child prodigy skill, but you know we don't we don't really choose what the gods give us, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, when I was five years old, I knew way more Toby Keith lyrics than I probably should have. So, uh, speaking right. of useless child prodigies, <laughs> the, the, the Toby Keith child prodigy. There you go. <laughs> So, uh, does Moldvay D and D still remain kind of your uh, your favorite game system of all time, or have there been others that have uh, you know usurped it in in the you know time that you've been playing RPGs? I mean, well, Moldvay Basic Set is still way up there, and in fact was the basis for my own retro clone Adventure Conqueror King system. So I have to count that as one of the very, my very top RPG systems. 
Um, I was also very impressed um, by the DC Heroes Megs system by Greg Gordon. I think that's another game system that's uh, absolute, you know, genius level design. And then Cyberpunk 2020 by Mike Pondsmith um, remains one of my all-time favorites. Um, just that game is a, a masterpiece of designing for setting and mood you want to create with the system. Uh, just top notch. Oh yeah, absolutely. Now, when it comes to both playing RPGs as a player and then on the uh, the other side of the screen as the GM, we all tend to develop our own styles that you know we just find we have the most fun with. So if you had to describe your style as a player and as a GM, how would you describe that? Right. Okay, as a player, it's probably worth saying that I've never once survived any campaign I've ever been in. My character always dies. <laughs> And I, I go into every campaign very much like a samurai. Like, I'm going <laughs> to die, but the importance is that I die gloriously. Hmm. And, um, and, I, and I therefore always just have a ton of fun. And I'm usually, you know, usually my death is, is uh, you know, heroically on behalf of others. And um, but I, I guess I, I enjoy that in the sense it lets me, uh, it lets me take massive risks and, um, uh, you know, I don't enjoy playing a role-playing game where I, um, you know, I, I uh, am spending all my time being fearful and nervous. Mm -hmm. So as a game master, uh, you know, I have a pretty strong philosophy of how I game master. And I, I actually wrote a book about it called Arbiter of Worlds, um, which, I, which I threw up on Amazon. It's a collection of essays I had written for The Escapist many years ago. And I, I bundled them together and, and turned it into a book. And um, so my, my theory of game mastering is that tabletop role-playing games can offer one thing that no other genre of game can offer, and that's player agency. And what I mean by that is the ability to make meaningful choices that have real consequences. Um, you know, they're passive entertainment. You don't have any agency at all, right? You're long for the ride. Video games, you can have some agency, but it's always straight-jacketed by the computer or the console design. It's limited. Um, but with a tabletop game, with a live game master, you know, you can really do anything. Um, and the key is that the consequences have to be meaningful or the choice is illusory. You know, if no matter what you choose, you always win, that was really no choice at all. And so I try and run sandbox games that have maximal player agency uh, with very fair objective rules, um, you know, clear consequences for success, clear consequences for failure. And then I stand back and I let the players um, make the choices that matter to them. And sometimes that results in them saving the world, and sometimes that results in them becoming ne'er-do-wells that running around <laughs> causing havoc as the world falls down around them. Um, and sometimes it results in horrible death for everyone involved. Um, but whatever happens, it's because of their choices. And I think it's a, it's a really powerful way to play. Gotcha. Gotcha. So you... I, I've started to think of this as... Uh, I've started calling it the Watchmaker GM... You set up the pieces, you set everything in motion, you wind the watch, let it go, and then let the players kind of interact with right. everything you've set up. Uh, and I found that's really one of the more effective GMing styles uh, because there's not so much that element of you broke this thing, it's I'm going to set this up, and the players are more than likely going to break this thing. So, uh, right. you know... That's very much a philosophy that I have a lot of sympathy with, and, and something that I've tried to develop in my own play style as well. Yeah, exactly. I, I haven't heard that term, the watchmaker approach, but I like it. I'm going to steal that. Yeah, it's. I, it almost reminds me of of deism in in a way, and and the way that they kind of approach uh, the the idea of God as the watchmaker. And so, you know, people say that the GM is the god. So. Uh, you know, if, if you are that kind of GM, then I guess you're a deistic god. Yeah, that's fair. I, you know, it's funny you use that, because in my book, I actually also say that uh, the GM is God, but he's also Satan. But he's Satan, <laughs> yeah. but he's Satan in the sense of Satan in the book of Job, where, uh, you know, the book of Job, Satan works for God mm -hmm. as sort of his uh, tester. And, um, you know, God tests Job through Satan, but God, at the end of the day, wants Job to win. He wants Job to prove that he's, you know, a good dude. And likewise, as a game master, like, I certainly want my players to have a good time. I want them to enjoy themselves and, and struggle and triumph. 
But at the same time, I put on my Satan hat, and now I'm the adversary, and I have to give it my all to, um, you know, to play fairly as the adversary. All at the same time, remembering I'm also you know, the, yep. the godlike figure and need to be neutral. So it's, uh, it's, it, it can create some cognitive dissonance, but I think that's part of the fun uh, it's of, of sort of the mental multitasking of being a game master. Okay, uh, now now that that's out there, I, I just have to say now, this this just kind of occurred to me, OSR GMs, and really any GM who wants to give your players a serious challenge, read the book of Job. You might find something, uh, you know, illuminating about your role in that book, regardless of where you stand on religion. So, thank you for that, Alex. I, I actually... <laughs> A lot of pieces just kind of click together, you know, growing up in church, the the book of Job is always something that's there, but now being able to apply that to role playing, uh, thank you. Sincerely, so I thank you. I didn't grow up in church. I ended up reading the Bible, like, circuitously as a need to do, like, research for being a better game master, and I was like, oh, this is so fascinating, <laughs> you know, like... I swear, I, most of the books I've ever read in my life, like the nonfiction books, have been some weird research project for some, you know, role-playing game campaign along the way. <laughs> and, you know, my poor family members are always wondering what I'm up to. Like, why are you reading a book on mushroom farming? I'm like, I'm working on dwarven <laughs> fortresses, you know? <laughs> so. so, in this hobby, we, we find that, you know, those of us who dedicate a lot of time to it, do shows like this, create RPG systems, we have a lot of fond memories tied up with this hobby. Otherwise, we wouldn't, you know, focus so much on it. So if you had to pick a fondest RPG memory, what would that be for you? Oh, wow, that's a great question. Um, gosh, so one really fond memory was playing cyberpunk 2020 and we had one of the players characters had was was thought to have been killed but so the group abandoned him and moved on into a major battle and unbeknownst to the group uh the player's character had actually survived and um you know sort of through some off table uh, gameplay that we handled privately he had uh, made it to the scene of the battle and at a critical moment was actually able to intervene and he came crashing through the window and joined the group. And it was the only time in my life I ever saw a player get a standing ovation from the other <laughs> players. Like they literally stood up and were like cheering. They were so happy because he was their best combatant and they like threw their arms up and, you know, because of his arrival, um, you know, they won, they won the battle. And it was, it was really awesome because you realize, man, this, this game really means something to these people. They really wanted their characters to live. They were genuinely happy that their friend arrived. It transformed the nature of the evening for everyone. And, you know, they still talked about it years later. And I, I contrast that with how often you see in, a, um, you know, in, in, in games today that the players, the challenge level is so low that the players are just competing for the spotlight, right? Like there's yeah. no question who's going to kill the enemy. It's just each person sort of narcissistically wanting to be the one who gets the kill shot and the enemy. Whereas this, you know, this moment was so powerful because the people genuinely were afraid of losing their characters. And here was another person arriving in a heroic moment and them making him feel like a hero for it. And, um, you know, as a GM, like I just can't think of anything more powerful than that is to you know set up a situation where a person like literally is getting a standing ovation from friends who in that moment feel like their lives were saved like that was that was really powerful so i think that's my favorite moment that that is a fantastic moment to to be a favorite and again you know based on what you were saying there uh something that i've been thinking about a lot recently there's this big emphasis on uh backstories for characters when you're first bringing them to the table uh, that you find in a lot of, like, RPG forums and things like that. And I will say I've been one uh, to advocate for bring, you know, bring a backstory. Know who your character is before bringing it to the table. Um, but I think a lot of the the players who write these 20-page backstories, which, again, I've done, and I think every RPG player has done at some point just because you wanted your cool character. You wanted your character who was going to be 
you know, part of those stories that everyone tells for years and years to come. But what a lot of people fail to realize is that doesn't come about from how cool you make your character before you get to the table. It comes about from what happens to your character at the table over a long period of playing the game. And so if we could rediscover emergent storytelling and Amen. not really leaning so heavily on here's all the pieces that I set up for my character and here's the arc that I want my character to go on. If we can get back to just discovering what's our character going to do based on what we're encountering here and the stories that come out of that, I, th I think we'll be in a lot better place as a hobby and we'll have a, a little bit of a healthier mindset towards, uh, you know, what an RPG character is supposed to be from beginning to end. I agree completely. I do. Um, I, I, like you, I, I've certainly written my share of character backstories, and I think it's a little bit game dependent. You know, for instance, if um, if you're, as an example, playing a, a game of white wolf vampire, and you're told that your character is supposed to be, you know, we're going to start off as ancient vampires with extra character points to build with. You know, obviously, you should have more character backstory. Your guy's 200 years old. Um, I think where where it becomes a strange phenomenon is when you're starting off as a first level character on his first adventure and you show up with 20 pages of backstory. I mean, <laughs> yep. you know, it's like, I'm, you know, I'm, 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 I'm like a 46 year old dude. I don't think I have 20 pages of backstory. I really <laughs> didn't have 20 pages of backstory when I was 16 or 18, like, you know, so, and I think it, um, it as you say, it detracts from the emergent storytelling that comes um, from the experience. And, you know, and, and, and frankly, it, it doesn't play to the strength of the medium. Like, you know, you're going to get bas better passive storytelling from reading a novel than you're ever going to get from a tabletop game, but you can get urgent storytelling that's better than anything else. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I do think a lot of this comes down to, uh, you know, so many people want to recreate moments from the fantasy, you know, media that they love that ultimately brought them to the table. And... You know, if you want to write a story where a character hits all the points you want them to write, then just write a story, write a book, write a movie, you know, what whatever it is that you're trying to create there. But when it comes to bringing a character to a, a role-playing game, uh, minimize that and just let the story unfold and let your reactions and how you interpret the environment that you're in create that story. Exactly. And, you know... Those moments will come, but you know what made them. What makes the moments powerful in a book is, as the reader of the book, we don't know what's going to happen, and um, and the authors make a sphere for the characters' lives. And you know, we were all shocked at the Red Wedding and in, in Game of Thrones and things like that. You know, if you go into the RPG with this sort of pre-plot in your head, even if the moment happens, the moment won't be the meaningful moment that you wanted to yeah. because there was it was illusory. So, yeah. And, and like I talked about a few weeks ago with DM Bloodworth, uh, the, the best case scenario is exactly what you thought was going to happen happens. And worst case scenario, all of your plans have been completely scattered. So either way, you're going to be either extremely disappointed or uh, you're just going to get exactly what you thought you were going to get. So there's no surprise. There's no... Uh, you know, th there's no outburst of emotion uh, internally because you, uh, you know, you called your shot and then did it. So, right. th you know, there's, there's nothing to discover there. Exactly. It's, you know, it's funny because we as a culture take spoilers really seriously, right? Yeah. Like, you know, we'll freak out if someone posts spoilers on Reddit. We'll avoid reading social media to not have a favorite movie that we want spoiled. But then when we come into the tabletop role-playing games, you know, we bring these expectations in that are effectively spoilers. Mm -hmm. um, I think far, far, better, far better to go in wanting an emergent story and, um, and, and enjoying the ride. Absolutely. Now, there's uh, one last of these kind of introductory questions. I like to ask this question because I feel it really cuts to the psyche of the people that I'm talking to. The answer to this can be as philosophical or as sophomoric as you want it to be. All right, I'm ready. So, Alex, if you could put anything on a T-shirt, what would it be? <laughs> uh, 
I think so I used to have a little motto that I had on my uh, social media account, and I think it would be this. It was a it's a quote attributed to Hannibal of Carthage, and the quote was "Find a way or make one." And I think that that's been um, my philosophy as a game designer, as an entrepreneur: find a way or make one. So sometimes the sometimes the pathway you need has already been created by others before you, and you can find it by searching. And you know sometimes you have to. Uh, uh, you have to forge it yourself. But either way, there's a way to do it. Um, and you have to believe that going forward into it. So find a way or make one. That would be my t-shirt. Gotcha. And then there'd be like, um, probably like some really awesome Frank Frazetta art of like a ripplingly muscled dude and a hot warrior woman with him for no apparent reason. You see, in my mind, uh, you know, obviously that's a very, you know, a very poignant saying and a very, a very cool visual there. But in my mind, I was picturing like an elephant with a very shocked expression on its face, trying not to slide down a very steep mountain. <laughs> yeah, that, that's right. But, but the elephant is illustrated by Frank Frazetta. Yes. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, okay. absolutely. I, it's a Frank Frazetta elephant mm. and it's got like a barbarian on the back. Yeah. <laughs> the elephant's like, how, how did we end up in the Alps, bro? Like, what, like, what is going on? Oh, that is that's fantastic. <laughs> but no, like that that really is a that's a great that's a great inspirational T-shirt, and I don't think I've seen that on a T-shirt. So, yeah, yeah, excellent should make that t-shirt i shall i sell t-shirts for my uh for my on my autark emporium store i should make that t-shirt i don't know why i haven't done that yeah absolutely we're doing it we're gonna have we're gonna put the <laughs> elephant on it <laughs> <laughs> that, that'll really sell it now uh obviously with ascendant being what it is uh you know it's fair to assume that you are a comic book fan so i really want to dig into uh you know which comics really kind of spoke to you as a comic book fan which comics do you consider you know your favorites uh you know where do you come at this as a uh, a comic book fan or from the comic angle sure yeah so my biggest comic book collecting years were 1985 to 2000 um and i primarily connected collected green lantern uh batman and superman so i was a dc fan um the whole Green Lantern run of Hal Jordan giving up his ring, uh, John Stewart taking over, the Green Lantern Corps forming, the Crisis on Infinite Earth um, was some of my favorite to- favorites. Uh, and then uh, Frank Miller's Dark Knight, Batman run, Frank Miller Daredevil also, although that was a little earlier and I kind of went back to buy that. Um, and then the Watchmen series. Uh, and then a lot of... Um, the various image comics that had, you know, the, with the, the really lush art, all the pouches. So kind of that time period um, was my my favorite for comics. Um, then I stepped away for a while uh, from the comic space. Then I came back and I got into a lot of the more, um, you know, I wouldn't call them alternative, but they weren't necessarily DC and Marvel. So, um, uh, for instance, Kieran Gellin's comic series, Uber, was really awesome. Um, about like the World War II superheroes. Um, I really enjoyed Invincible, was excellent. Um, so uh, let's see, what are some others that are big favorites? Uh, Authority, um, Squadron Supreme, I really liked. Um, and of course, uh, Mark Miller's The Boys was really good. Mm. So I would say my early comic book stage was very much um, straight up Justice League, you know, big time heroes doing heroic things, cosmic conflicts, etc. And then, uh, and then I kind of got it from there. I got into deconstructions and reconstructions of those genre tropes, I guess. Gotcha, gotcha. Now I do have to ask because, um, in in my opinion, the '80s is the best period of comics for the big two, hands down. There are so many great comics that came out of the eighties and into, uh, you know, the very beginning of the nineties. And one series in particular that I have a great fondness for is legends of the dark Knight. Did you collect much of that? I did not. I did not. Should I, should I, should I be buying that to read? So legends of the dark Knight, um, 
some would call it a mixed bag just because it was different creative teams for each uh, story that was being told. But like the first four arcs are fantastic. Okay, I will check it out. Um, I remember looking back, the the comic I remember so much from that one is in Green Lantern Corps when um, uh, when John Stewart, uh, John Stewart gets married and then his wife gets killed. And I remember as a kid being like, oh, man, like they went there. You know, it was and you just get this uh, this this shock because at the same time, you know, like the 19 days was also when we had He-Man and G.I. Joe cartoons and nobody ever dies. Right. Yeah. Like, you know, endless amounts of bullets are flying. Nobody ever dies. And um, it was it was pretty shocking. So and of course, you know, the, the Dark Knight series hit me like a truck when I read that the first time. You're like, whoa, <laughs> you know, so it's good. It's good. Oh, gosh, to be like 11 to 15 years old again, discovering comics, fun times. Now, had kind of the like overuse of the uh, the, you know, murdering of loved ones ground you down by the time you got to the 90s and major force was shoving <laughs> Kyle Rayner's girlfriend. Into <laughs> yeah, 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 no, it definitely. Well, you know, the, the realization is like, wait a minute, they can't <laughs> kill the, they can't kill the hero because that would end the comic book. So mm-hmm. all the loved ones are actually there to get slaughtered. And it's just very then you're like, oh, that's that's actually kind of depressing. Like yep. you, you made me you made me love them. So you would kill them. <laughs> er. So Yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, uh, definitely. You, you, that when that realization comes, you know, that changes. I. I and uh don't let my shirt fool you i know like i'm wearing a captain america shirt i do have great affection for cap but i am more of a dc guy myself so uh you're you're in uh good company here when it comes to talking about dc comics yeah listen i don't want to in any way uh say that i'm not a fan of marvel like i like marvel comics as well um it just it, it what it actually happened was that my father was a fan of dc comics and he bought me my first comics and so i started with dc um, yeah, strangely enough, my father was a Green Lantern fan, like, which at the time seemed absolutely normal to me. But like years later, like, why was my father a Green Lantern fan? That's so <laughs> random. But, um, but yeah, so my first comic I ever got was Green Lantern. So that was how I ended up on the DC track. And, uh, I kept, you know, as a kid, I kept waiting for years for an alien to show up and give me a power ring powered by my mind and <laughs> just never, never happened. I was like, maybe I wasn't born without fear. <laughs> Damn. How about you? What was your uh, what was your favorite uh, hero? I I've made a lifelong Batman fan. Batman has Batman. always been a favorite of mine. Um, and again, it it kind of started uh, with my dad as well. Uh, my dad was very like passively familiar with comics, but he knew a lot about the Super Friends. And uh. as soon as I could like watch cartoons and understand what was going on. Uh, we'd watch Batman the Animated Series and Superman the Animated Series because it was on and it was popular in, you know, the late 90s when I was, uh, you know, gaining cognizance. But he also wanted me to watch Super Friends with him because that's how he remembered these heroes. Ah, uh, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I was very... Everything was very DC heavy because of how, you know, popular Batman was. I watched right. Spider-Man and X-Men too, but Batman was the king of them all and then dad pushing super friends on me. It it was inevitable at that point. You know, you're watching like Batman as a kid like, you know, thought process you're like, you know, if my parents were incredibly wealthy and then got killed, I bet I could be a super. <laughs> <rescue, laughs> you know? Like like the only thing that's holding me back is that just not filled with enough bitter rage over my parents' death, and also I didn't inherit a billion dollars. But other than that, <laughs> totally could have done it. Absolutely. Now, uh, on the other side of the coin there with superheroes, we have superhero RPGs. Uh, so you mentioned the the DC Heroes RPG. Uh, were there any others that you kind of played a lot of? And, uh, you know, what what are your thoughts in general on most of the superhero RPGs that are out there oh sure so uh first one i ever played was dc heroes um then i got um marvel superheroes so called phase rip Mm -hmm. uh, another amazing system 
Um, I also had a game which is less well known in the US, but was really popular in the United Kingdom called Golden Heroes, which was a really great system. Uh, it was the first game I ever saw that actually called the turns pages and your actions panels. So that's where that idea comes from in Ascendant Golden Heroes. Um, and then uh, I went through, like, like every young man must, I went through a Palladium Games phase. So I picked up Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Heroes Unlimited and Rifts and Robotech and, and, and an embarrassingly large amount of Palladium Games, let's be honest. <laughs> um, so played all of those. Um, then uh, was White Wolf's Aberrant, uh, and then later um, I picked up Champions. Never really played much Champions, but I had it. Um, I had the Fusion version of Champions as well, and then I got Mutants and Masterminds, uh, first edition, Mutants and Masterminds, second edition, and then Icons. So I think I've played, and I've run campaigns of uh, DC Heroes, Golden Heroes, um, and Mutants and Masterminds. And I've run a bunch of one-offs of icons. So I've definitely done my tours of duty with superhero RPGs. Um, my two favorites remain DC Heroes and Phase Rip. Uh, and, and those were the two primary inspirations for Ascendant, with a smattering of some stuff that I really liked from Golden Heroes, Mutants and Masterminds, etc. In general, I think um, some of the best game design work that's ever been done in the tabletop space has been done in superhero games. Um, there's been some, you know, really, really innovative gameplay mechanics that first come to fruition uh, in those games, and um, because of the complexity mm -hmm. it, uh, uh, of, of, of the play space you're trying to build, um, I think it, it has really called developers to be their best when working on those games. Yeah, absolutely. Superheroes present several unique challenges uh, that a lot of other settings or genres don't necessarily present. Uh, now, this is not the case with 5e, but with a fantasy RPG, you're typically not going to have, uh, you know, super mega powerful beings working alongside regular humans. Uh, right. So you have to you have to find a balance where, you know, a player who really loves Batman or Daredevil or Punisher can bring someone like that to the table uh, same as a hero or a player who loves a hero like, you know, Superman or uh, Thor or Green Lantern, someone like that. <clears throat> and then there's also the idea that in, you know, in the superhero genre, for the most part, there's not really this fear that your character is going to die every time. It's not as, uh, you know, gritty life or death necessarily as a Conan-inspired sword and sorcery game like right. D&D is meant to be. So you have to find a way to keep the challenge in there while still, uh, you know, knowing that at the end of the day, you're likely going to triumph or at the very, very least survive. So I, I do think there's lots of, uh, you know, creative thinking and, and tinkering that needs to be done to really keep the integrity of the experience alive when it comes to superhero RPGs. Yeah, it's definitely a challenge. Um, in Ascendant, I ended up offering a couple different systems for how to handle player death. Um, is a, in a sense, depending what genre or era of comic books you're emulating, you know, the way it, it's handled can be totally different, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, a Golden Age game, Silver Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age, you know, character death is going to be a very different experience. Uh, the default in Ascendant is that if your character dies, um, you uh, aren't dead, but you lose a bunch of character points and have to take some some sort of drawbacks or rebuild your character in some way to reflect that. So, you know, if your character gets killed, you might have to take the, you know, disfigured appearance and missing limb drawback. And uh, so now you've lost some character points and he got all scarred up and lost his limb. And until you reaccumulate more character points, you're going to be at a disadvantage. And I think that plays well for, for you know, a pretty broad... Uh, kind of bronze into modern age environment. Um, you can certainly do, uh, uh, there's some other options the game presents, like dead is dead, make a new character. Um, or also like, uh, you know, mysteriously unaffected, like, you know, the smoke clears and you cough and you're fine. And, you know, you lost the battle, but you're okay. Um, the way we handle the, that sense of how do we, how do we stage the, 
the uh, keep it keep it challenging, even though you know your character will probably live. So the game uses a challenge rating system, um, and your hero points, which are kind of your mana or your action currency for doing cool things, um, get replenished when you beat challenges. And so if you fail to stop certain challenges, um, your hero points won't replenish, which in turn makes you more vulnerable. And so um, and and limits you from doing some of the cool, fun things that you otherwise might like to do. And so what tends to happen is, um, you know, if if the battle turns against you, you start to skim on the hero points because you need them to keep yourself alive, which then makes it harder to, you know, maybe save the city so there's more collateral damage, which in turn means you'll get fewer hero points back at the end of the battle, mm -hmm. which will make the next fight tougher. And then eventually it can cascade into a situation where you do end up you know, getting killed and suffering those longer term consequences, or you figure out how to turn it around and then you get your big replenishment of hero points and you're, you've renormalized. And we've run um, two, two really healthy campaigns using the system and it's, it's kept the challenge level high throughout. And um, we, uh, we had ultimately in the Star Spangled Squadron campaign, you know, we had three characters go down as, uh, as dead over 30 sessions. So, um, which felt, you know, if you figure each session is an issue, so you had like, you know, Justice League, three years of Justice League, three characters suffering some sort of severe misfortune felt plausible. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Now, once a year, right? Yeah. Once every 12 issues. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Now, something that I found interesting, uh, just kind of, you know, looking through Ascendant, um, you, you've taken great pains to essentially scale real life and real uh you know like what something would weigh what you know how far something would be and scale it into kind of a unified system of measurement uh just for for constant reference uh which is not something that i've seen many if any rpgs do so you know what was it that made you think uh you know th this is something that i need to pay close attention to, or this is something that I need to, uh, you know, put time and effort into for this game. Uh, and I do think it's a good thing, by the way. So that's not, that's not me saying, why'd you spend so much time on this? Uh, cause I find it super interesting. Yeah. So the original DC heroes game by Greg Gordon, also known as, uh, Megs for May Mayfair expansion gaming system, um, used a system where each ability score, uh, point was worth twice what preceded it. So, um, if you had a strength of 10, you could lift twice as much as a man who had a strength of nine, who could lift twice as much as a strength of eight. And so they were the first system to use um, an exponentially increasing table like Ascendant does. Um, they used it for strength, for speed, for time, a few other, a few other parameters. But they didn't uh, f go fully exponential. They didn't go fully logarithmic in their math. Um, and as an example of that, in DC Heroes, you know, Batman had a body of six. And so that meant he could take six points of damage, and that could be delivered as one hit that does six damage or six hits that do one damage. It was perfectly fine, perfectly enjoyable game. But if you take seriously the idea that six is twice as much as five, which is twice as much as four, which is twice as much as three, then in fact, six hits of one point of damage is nowhere near equal to one six point hit. It's a vastly smaller number. Yeah because it's actually 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. So it should take 64 hits to knock out Batman. Yep. And so I thought to myself, I wonder if one could make a game which is fully based on logarithmic math in every way, which has a lot of virtues to it, because the virtue of logarithmic math is that it, it becomes scale-free, so that you can simulate four people fighting as easily as you simulate 16 people fighting as easily as you simulate 16,000 people fighting. And um, all complex um, multiplication and division just become simple addition and subtraction of all physical quantities. And so, um, and, uh, and, and it happens that my local gaming group um, is most of the players are from an AI company filled with game theorists. And they were like, mm, that is a fascinating idea, Alex. I challenge you to explore that. And I thought, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. And so I, I, I kind of set off on this Don Quixote quest to create a fully logarithmic, physics-based superhero game. And, um, and, I, and I did it. And, um, and then I went through a really extensive period of playtesting to make sure it was fun. 
Um, but when I set out, like I, I definitely, if you had told me like, hey, Alex, you're going to make this logarithmic superheroes game and it's going to be the number one bestseller on drive through RPG and it's a 500 page book. Like, A, I don't know if I would have started if I'd known it was going to take a 500 page book to do. And B, I definitely wouldn't have thought that it would be a number one bestseller. Um, but apparently math is the secret to success in role playing games. I don't know. Um, it is it, it is really interesting to me because you hear so often that people don't want crunch anymore. They just want rules like games. They want narrative games. You know, and this is not a narrative game. This is a traditional 80s and 90s style crunchy game. And um, it's done very well and people are really into it. And got it's doubled the size of my Discord server. Um, so anyway, that was the origin. It was a kind of a, a Don Quixote quest. Yeah, and for anyone... Uh kind of wondering about the scale of of what 500 pages is i've held up and i can't get to it now because it's in my new place uh we're, we're in the midst of moving right now which is why there's so many boxes behind me uh but i've held up the hefty tome that is dungeon crawl classics uh that is 506 pages so we're talking about a book that's very similar in in size here uh it's a this is likely a gigantic tome um, yeah, I'm holding it up here. You can see it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. It's big. Yeah, and it's, it's heavy. You can use it as a weapon. You know, <laughs> that's... Absolutely. Yeah. And and honestly, you know, I I've been one who's you know been into a lot of uh you know dungeon crawl classics, OSR games, uh you know retro clones of original D&D that kind of stuff. That's that's very much been where my head is at. Uh but there is still out there a thirst for crunch. I I was talking to uh you know one of my uh one of my gaming friends this was, you know, some months back, but he was really lamenting the fact that, you know, 5e is not crunchy. It's not, you know, D&D is not crunchy anymore and he said I really miss uh, you know, that aspect of gaming, you know, having all of these different, you know, tables and charts to consult, everything's very precise, everything's, you know, based on uh, core principles that build this, you know, very detailed level of crunch. And so I think you really have supplied something that's been missing, uh, you know, for, for years now. Uh, even, you know, for, for as much as people call Pathfinder Mathfinder... It's not mm -hmm. that it's crunchy, it's that it's overly complicated for what it actually is. Well, I mean, look, you know, we can call it Mathfinder, but um, if Ascendant ends up being half as successful as Pathfinder, I would take that as a win. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. So uh, I, I, I assume the design, I, I assume uh, Paizo is math finding its way to the bank. So yeah. uh, good on them, right? Mm -hmm. And and I do think you're right. Like there is an audience for crunch. And in general, as a as an independent game designer, um, I think it pays to be a little bit contrarian. Like um, there's a hundred other guys out there that are all trying to do games, and if 99 of them are all offering narrative rules like product, um, you're the only one who's offering the 500 page crunch. Like that's a good place to be in, relatively speaking. I like I like to sail in the blue waters rather than in the muddy brown waters where all the other ships are. So yeah, absolutely. And you know the 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 fruits of that have already you know kind of been yielded here because you are number one on drive through as we're speaking right now. So there's definitely a desire for it, and you've definitely kind of you know filled that desire in a lot of people. Um, one other aspect that I find super interesting about this game, it's not just that you focused on the, uh, you know, the combat side of things when it comes to superheroes, which a lot of RPGs do. You also have paid a lot of attention to the investigation and crime solving side of things as well. Uh, so, you know, talk a little bit about that and, and why you felt that was important. Sure. As a game designer, I think that you can tell what a game is about based on what amount of page space it devotes to particular game mechanics. You can tell what the game of Dungeons and Dragons is about just by looking at the amount of space dedicated to spells and combat versus the amount of space dedicated to social interaction. 
And it is very clearly a game about exploring dungeons and fighting things, you know, using magic and combat. So in doing Ascendant, I thought to myself, you know, the vast, the vast majority of comic book action um, involves things that are more than just slugfests. It's mm -hmm. saving the day. It's solving crime as the world's greatest detective. It's preventing national, national disasters. And the beauty of the logarithmic system is that anything I could possibly think of, I could tackle using it. Um, you know, it, it almost became like uh, this realization for me that actually the whole world is based on math, and so therefore I can simulate anything. Um, so the uh, investigation system um, is uh, very full-featured. Uh, you know, it covers everything from straight up you know, investigating a crime scene to um, biochemical analysis, um, you know, all the different databases you can access to solve crimes, um, interviewing witnesses, you know, good cop, bad cop tech tactics, all sorts of fun stuff like that is all in there. So you could actually play Ascendant and use it to run a police procedural if you wanted to, no superpowers required. Likewise, in saving the day rules, um, you know, I've got rules for firefighting, I've got rules for dealing with tsunamis, volcanoes, earthquakes, bomb threats, hostage negotiation. Um, and I, you know, I, it took me over two years to write the game in part because I was doing so much research. But like the firefighting rules, for instance, I actually downloaded all of the real world firefighting manuals for the volumes of water needed and the, the hose pressure and how long it takes buildings to burn down. And, um, and the game actually simulates all of that. Like it, it matches up to all of the real world metrics. So you could use Ascendant if you wanted to, and you could run a paramedic and firefighter RPG, no superpowers required and just run around the game world and fight fires. Um, then it has the super element. So if you're a crime fighter and you can mind read, like, wow, this is how, how much better you can solve crimes. If you're a firefighter and you have water control, this is how you can use water control to put out fires. Um, and some of our absolute best sessions so far in running the game have been those, those sort of sessions where we did, you know, they went to Haiti doing disaster relief after an earthquake and got to use all of those rules. It was, it was a blast. So that was the origin. I wanted to, I wanted to simulate all the things you can do in a comic. And one thing I have to give you props for, and this is something, again, that I've talked about on the show before, a lot of times with role-playing games, because fantasy role-playing is, you know, the origin point, that's where everything kind of begins with RPGs as a, a medium. So often because of that and because of how prevalent fantasy role-playing is, when it comes to other genres people tend to treat those games as we're playing D&D, &D, but instead of Dungeoneers, we're superheroes, or we're cowboys, or we're spies, or whatever it is. And when that happens, that's when the burnout of, okay, you know, we, we messed around a little bit in this world, I'm bored now, what do we do, comes in. And it really seems like you have built this around the idea of being a superhero is completely different from being a fantasy adventurer. And so here's essentially the way you need to think about what you can do in this world, how you can interact with things. Uh, and, and here's the mechanics for doing what you need to do as a superhero besides just, uh, you know, punching general Zod or, uh, you know, having a, a space battle uh, near apocalypse uh, so again, hats off to you for, for thinking in that way and, and designing the game around that. Thanks. Yeah, that was absolutely, uh, an important goal. You know, I, and there's a section in the back of the book where I talk about the recommended framework for how to build the campaign out. And I, I suggest you create like a super organization as the hook that everyone is plugged into. And then that organization can afford them the opportunity to bring in new characters and go on missions and have a headquarters. Mm -hmm. And there's rules for building out your organization and everything in there. And um, and we've had a lot of fun. Uh, right now we've got one campaign where they were the Soaring, Sab uh, the Soaring Sabers, which is the Chinese national superhero team. <laughs> we had another one where they're the Star Spangled Squadron, which is the US team, which works for the Coast Guard. Um, and uh, a, a bunch of folks are also doing, uh, you know, private police force superheroes, all sorts of stuff. So, and it, as you say, it's very different. You're not a fantasy adventurer, you're a superhero, um, but it works. 
Now, one question I have for you, because you mentioned, uh, you know, that RPG group that's filled with, uh, you know, people who work in, in AI, and a lot of this has been kind of based around math. So I just have to ask, when it comes to playing with groups who aren't filled with uh, computer science whizzes or people who, you know, care very much about math, when it comes to just, you know, a group of random people from, you know, different backgrounds who may or may not even know what logarithm means, how do they pick up the system and, and what's been kind of the experience in running uh, games for, you know, those kinds of players? Yeah, at the player facing level, the game is super simple. Um, the complexity was very much front-loaded in terms of the game design, and also character creation can be complex. But, it, you know, if I wanted to run a pickup game of Ascendant, I would probably offer pre-created characters rather than say, hey, person who's never played this game before, you know, come spend six hours building your character or whatever. <laughs> like, that would obviously be a bad a bad way to introduce the game. Oh, yeah. um, but, uh, you know, I've run the game at some local conventions, and it plays really smoothly with with new folks. Um, the core mechanic is, is super simple. You simply, you have an attribute, which is called your acting value. Uh, it's opposed by a difficulty value. Um, so you subtract the difficulty value from the acting value to give you your, um, your RV or resolution value. And then you roll on a table. And that's all there is to it. It's just like the phase rip table with, uh, with four colors, you know, red, uh, orange, yellow, green, a white is a failure. Um, and it's one die roll. So let's say I'm attacking you um, you know, my agility is 10, your agility is 8, so I'm at plus 2, I roll a 100-sided die, the chart is printed right on my character sheet, so all I do is I find the plus 2 column and the 100, and that's the result. You don't need to understand logarithmic math or physics or anything to play the game. Um, I think probably the, uh, the game master probably has a higher burden because it would really help for them to understand what's going on, because often the game master is going to say, you know, I want to create uh, you know, I want to create the USS Arizona battleship and take them back in time to have a fight in World War II. And so the, the game master needs to understand how does the system work so he can, you know, model the U.S. Arizona or create appropriate challenges. So I think if I were a GM and I hated math and I was all about rules light narrative games, you know, probably I would pass on Ascendant in favor of other games. But as a player, it plays very rules light. Gotcha. Gotcha. So it's, uh, you know, on the player side, the, the selling point is very much, uh, you know, that it's pretty simple mechanic of, you know, roll, consult the chart. On the GM side, there's there's that more complex element that'll draw people in. So I I see now how uh, you can you can bring kind of multiple different people to this game. It's not necessarily just for, uh, you know, people who love logarithms. No, exactly, exactly. I mean, you know, so my, my local gaming group that I, that I ran with, like, you know, sort of my, my Durham crowd, I, I live in Durham, North Carolina, um, you know, we have one guy who's literally uh, an AI scientist. The second guy is an MIT, MIT PhD in computer science who was a <laughs> former game developer. Um, uh, but then we have their two spouses who... Um, I think one is like a history major and, you know, one does pharma sales. Um, you know, we have like a local guy who does business development. You know, none of them are, are math gurus and they're all able to play the game just as well. Like there's no, there's no like, oh, I can't understand this game. And in fact, uh, mechanically speaking, it's probably easier, um, easier math than some of the math that you ended up with in 3.5 when folks were calculating, you know, like, well, this is my fourth attack. So now I'm at minus 15, but, you know. Um, but again, the character, I, but I don't want to, I don't want to, um, overstate that because the character, com character building is definitely complex. And so, um, when we were building our characters, the folks that were more into the crunch helped the people that were not into crunch, make sure that their characters came out right. Gotcha. You know, if, ever, if everyone in your group absolutely hated crunchy character creation, probably not the, not the best game unless you as the GM want to create the characters for them. Yeah, Absolutely. And ultimately what that comes down to, uh, like with every system, is uh, just, you know, knowing the, the group that you're trying to run the game for. If you got a bunch of people who, uh, you know, love crunch, you're probably not going to uh, get them very invested in like a Vampire the Masquerade game. So, uh, exactly. you know, on the other end, if you've got people who, you know, 
are mostly familiar with you know, like powered by the apocalypse or other uh, more narrative driven games trying to you know bring them into a uh, a crunchier more complex system might result in some backlash early on if not you know just outright turn them off so my my advice for any gms out there looking to introduce something new to the table as i've harped about you know introduce new games to your players run different kinds of games don't just stay stuck in you know the what's popular or what's in the zeitgeist uh know the audience that you're bringing the game to and and know how to introduce it to them and how to uh kind of bring them into that world, especially if it's something very different from what they're used to. Yeah, amen to that. I, one of the beauties of the age we live in is that there's games for everyone, right? Like you can go on Drive RPG. I think they have 15,000 role-playing games now. Oh, yeah. Like think of a genre, think of a play style, think of a, a mechanic, you can find something you like. And that's fantastic. But that also means that, you know, not every game has to be for everyone. It's completely okay to make a niche game for a niche audience. Um, you know, and sometimes the very best games come about when the game designer just says, I'm just making this game that I want, that I would play with my friends. And if you like it, you can play it too. But if it's not your cup of tea, don't drink it. You know, and, and often that creates the best. Whereas some of the, um, you know, some of the complaints about 5e is that they were trying to be all things to all people. Hmm. And so you get kind of a more watered down experience, um, you know, with the caveat that I think any game designer on the planet would be happy to have 5e sales. So apparently there's also something to be said for being something for all people, too. Hmm. Yeah, but, you know, to to put it in the terms of music, just to, you know, for the for the sake of a uh, an illustration, you can have a situation like uh, Huey Lewis and the News album Sports, where the label says, "Hey, we want hits," and they built an album designed to generate as many hits as possible. But you can also have something like uh, Twenty One Twelve by Rush, where the band went, "Screw it, no one's buying our records anyway. Uh, we're gonna do what we want," and it also be a massive success. So, honestly, it's it's. As a creator of RPGs, it, what it comes down to is what do you think is going to be successful, and are you prepared to fail? That's right. That's right. Did you know that Russia's 2112 is based on Ayn Rand's uh, anthem? Yes. Novel? Yes, because awesome. I I am both a lover of Rush and a uh, an appreciator of Rand. So. Uh, well, we're in, we're in good company here then. Amen, brother. As uh, as one of my favorite authors and podcasters, Michael Malice says, Rand may not have all the answers, but she definitely has all the right questions. Yeah, that's a really good way to put it. It's a really good way to put it. Oh. And of course, you know, Atlas Shrug nowadays reads like prophecy. So <laughs> yes, I I can't tell you how many people I've heard just like talk about Galt's Gulch recently, and I'm like, ah, oh. if she could only see yeah. what was going on right now. Yep. Yeah. Well, I basically have gone gold. I mean, you know, I have a I have a degree from Harvard Law School, but I um I uh, I work in my little gulch and make tabletop role playing games. So it's uh you know she kind of leaves out the part in the book that when you become when you when you sort of go gold, your income really drops a lot. Yeah. It's worth, <laughs> worth, it's worth noting. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Rand, uh, for anyone who hasn't read Ayn Rand, it's very much like wish fulfillment for people who want to be extremely independent and very yeah. much stick to, you know, the, the, the values that, that you have within your heart. Rand does not get into a lot of the uh, problems that come right. about in your personal life when you uh, try to do stuff like that. It's very much, you know this is the highest virtue that you could possibly ascribe to. And here's all the amazing things that'll happen uh, when you do this. And down in the very, very fine print that Rand doesn't mention, you know, also there's going to be a lot of people who hate you and uh, want to kill yep. you and, and, you know, on and on and yep. on all the, all the negatives before you get to, you know, have that ultimate experience of, you know, living independently in Gulch Gulch. That's right. I, you know, I was rereading The Fountainhead recently, and um, and I, I was struck by the fact that as a kid, I had totally glossed over the fact that um, Howard Rourke ends up working as a as a 
day laborer in a quarry breaking <laughs> rock because he can't get a job as an architect. Mm -hmm. You know, as a kid, I totally glossed over that to the ending where he's like building skyscrapers. And I was like, oh, <laughs> oh, yeah. E right. So it's a, it's, a, it's a different experience to read it as an adult, for sure. Mm -hmm. Different experience. Now, ha having already you know mentioned Rand at this point, I need to ask because you're such a big DC fan, are you a question fan? You know, I, I I'm not, and I just completely like missed it until way later. Did I ever even find out that there was a connection? And I only learned it because I liked Watchmen and I liked Rorschach, and then people were like, well, you know, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I was like, oh, that that all makes sense now. So yeah, so I should probably at some point go and actually read the question and and. Um, you know, and get to the, get to the real meat of it. But I do like Rorschach from um, The Watchmen. Yeah. And with the question... Have you, have, have you read the question? Is it worth reading? It is, yeah. And a lot of the, a lot of the Steve Ditko stuff, it's, it's essentially like Steve Ditko went, I want to turn Randian philosophy into a superhero story. And then he did it even more so with a character called Mr. A that he did... Uh, uh, independently after DC bought up Charlton so we could kind of, you know, keep doing the question without doing the question. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So there's a character in Ascendant. Uh, you know, Ascendant has a little bit of a, a backstory to it. Um, mm -hmm. and There's like a default setting. You don't have to use it, but, you know, every RPG offers a setting. So there's a character in Ascendant who is, um, is a little bit of a wink-wink, nod-nod at Ayn Rand, which is um, the main villain uh, Maximilian Danextjold, who's named for the Atlas Shrugged character Ragnar Danextjold. Um, you know, and, and Ayn Rand calls her philosophy objectivism, and the idea is that you, know, you need to accept that reality is objective, and you need to use your reason to navigate through reality, right? A is A. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the premise of Ascendant is that, you know, superheroes are able to manipulate reality through their superpowers using um, you know, zero-point energy and their conscious will, and so Maximilian Danixjold is, is, is his backstory. He's a, he's a professor of Nietzschean philosophy who, um, through sheer will, actually, you know, kind of becomes an ubermensch and is able to manipulate reality. And so it's kind of like, well, what happens if you're a rational egoist, but you discover that through your willpower, you actually can reshape reality to your will? And then what happens to you? And um, so, you know, obviously he's a, he's a villain in the series. And... Um, so, but I had a lot of fun writing him as a as a kind of an interesting bad guy because he's you know he's one of the more intelligent and he's very philosophical. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I, I I concluded that it you know actually like a, a you know a genuine Nietzschean Ubermensch who could you know bend reality as will would be a very scary person, a very a very bad man. Oh yeah, yeah. Because I mean, you know, just thinking about the you know historical line you can draw from Schopenhauer to Nietzsche to. Hitler, ultimately, um, mm -hmm. we see what happens when a, a, a person believes, uh, you know, that they can reshape reality, you know, with the power of their will and what they will do, uh, given the opportunity and, and the means to do something like that. So, you know, given even more power than that, the power to literally warp reality, that could make for a very scary antagonist. So that's that's super interesting. Yeah, so the he he ends up in the, in the in the backstory of the game. So um, Dan Exjold ends up founding an organization, uh, a terrorist organization called Exodus, and the idea is they're they're Nietzschean, and it's um, they want to encourage humanity to overcome its humanity and to ascend, and uh, you know to become Ubermensches. And you know Nietzsche has this whole thing where it's like, um, you know, Ubermensch is to man as man is to ape, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, well, in Ascendant. You know, one of the one of the major ways characters gain their superpowers, the ways they ascend, is under really, really high stress um, and suffering. Their superpowers can manifest, and so the Exodus terrorists go around the world randomly causing acts of terror and mayhem and violence. Figuring, you know, you kill, you know, you kill a thousand people and two of them develop superpowers. Well, we're helping humanity evolve, and so there, it, it gives the game master a really built-in uh, enemy. Um, who is constantly out there wreaking havoc for the sake of wreaking havoc. And in the process of wreaking havoc, they're creating more people who, you know, become like them and wreak havoc. So it works really well, um, although it's, you know, it can be a, 
it, it definitely it, when we ran it uh, when, when when we ran the playtest campaign in the world you know shit goes out of control pretty fast on planet earth mm. oh yeah um yeah ascendant is very much just like the origin story of a superhero setting because it starts with almost no superheroes when the game begins and then things are uh, so it's it's like the origin of your characters but it's also the origin of a superhero universe so it's very much like our world but rapidly becoming a very strange place mm-hmm and if anyone uh, <clears throat> wants to see kind of a microcosm of what that philosophy can lead to, uh, you know, just a- as a real life example, um, look into the Leopold and Loeb murder case in the, I believe, the 1920s. And right. if you don't want to read through a whole bunch of court documents or, you know, you, you just want to watch a movie, uh, Alfred Hitchcock's Rope is essentially a retelling of the crime that happened there. Uh, I didn't know that about uh, the Hitchcock movie. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, the movie is brilliant. It's Hitchcock, but it's, it's a very, it's a film in a bottle. There's one setting for the movie. Uh, It plays out basically like a stage play that someone filmed and it's it's a very it's very simple. It leans a lot on the performances of the actors, uh, and it's very dialogue heavy. But it's it's a brilliant film. Huh. I'll have to check it out. Now you mentioned the uh, you know default setting, the backstory behind this world. There's a lot of that that's present in the uh, the book itself, but there's also a graphic novel on the way. Is there not? There is. Uh, it's called Ascendant Star Spangled Squadron. It's the origin story of America's superhero team. Um, uh, the book is written. It's a 96-page graphic novel. Um, we are going to be crowdfunding it starting in March on Indiegogo. So uh, over the next month is going to be the pre-launch campaigns. I'll be releasing um, the uh, video, t- uh, video trailer, uh, some preview art, things like that. Um, there's already a coming soon page set up on Indiegogo, which you can check out at... Um, uh, uh, I guess I'll, I'll provide the link to you if you, uh, if you want to share that with the gang later. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, uh, yeah, and I'm really excited about it. Uh, it was my first time writing a, um, a comic, um, but I had some really good mentors, uh, a fellow named uh, David Campetti, uh, who runs a Glasshouse Graphics, um, does a lot of uh, comics editing, uh, helped me. Um, Chuck Dixon was kind enough to provide some scripts to me uh, that I was able to read, um, and it, uh, you know, it, 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 I think it's probably one of the most fun projects I've ever undertaken. And, and I think the comic book has come out very well. Um, certainly the art team really brought their A game. Um, and it, you know, it has a great feel. It's intended to, uh, it's really, it, 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 it uh, I think if you liked 90s, uh, you know, 90s image comics, I'm um, in that vibe. I think it'll be a, a comic you enjoy. Yeah, and and like we were talking about before the show, uh, I am a a tremendous fan of Chuck Dixon. I really love and appreciate his work. In fact, uh, just a couple weeks ago, Chuck read a question uh, from Ryan Howard from Nashville, Tennessee, about if he had ever played role-playing games or if, uh, you know, the DC freelancers ever played role-playing games. Uh, So, you know, I'm a huge... I'm a huge Chuck Dixon fan, and the the fact that he was kind enough to uh, help you with that uh, just kind of warms my heart. Knowing that you know he's he's willing to you know share his knowledge and vast experience uh, with someone learning to write comics is that's that really is awesome. Yeah, he's he's a uh, a very 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 classy guy, and obviously knows the space better than anyone. Um, you know, I imagine he probably could have written the graphic novel that took me a year to write in you know a month in his spare time but that's that's the difference between having done it all your life and it being your first time diving in those that ten thousand hour rule right yep and for anyone unfamiliar with the name chuck dixon if you appreciate uh the batman villain known as bane you have him to thank indeed indeed him and graham nolan another Absolutely fantastic artist. Yep. Now, when it comes to the uh, 
the art in this role playing game, I have to say it's it's really fantastic. And you know, you you worked uh, at least on the cover and the you know logo design for uh, some of these characters with Jay Shields, who is you know friends with a few people that I'm friends with. He actually ran a Star Wars game at a convention that I played in. Um, but a lot of this art is very evocative, like you said, of 90s image and that very, uh, you know, 90s generation, uh, Mark Silvestri, Eric Larson, uh, Jim Lee type art. Uh, was that kind of the aesthetic you wanted to go for just from the beginning? Was that really? Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, that that's the aesthetic I like. It's the aesthetic I wanted to go for. Um it's as I said, I think there's value to being contrarian, and um, so that's not the art style that's being done in a lot of books nowadays. Right. Um, but I know that it has a big fan base. You can see the fan base for it in some of the successful uh, crowdfunding campaigns on Indiegogo. Um, I figure I love that art style. I know there's an audience for it. It's not it's not overdone in the market right now. You know, let's just embrace it. And um, so uh, I coined this term. Uh, iridium age for the vibe I was trying to come out with, which is like, you know, and why did I pick iridium? Cause it's a heavy metal. Yeah. So I wanted to have a sense <laughs> of there being like a little bit of a heavy metal aesthetic of, you know, sex and violence. Um, but at the same time, it's really shiny like silver. Mm -hmm. So, cause it's got, so it's kind of got like classic, classic heroes and, uh, and, you know, iconic costumes, but also like a little bit of a heavy metal um, sex and violence vibe to it. Uh, and I, I'm really happy with how it came out. Like it's one of my one of my favorite books I've ever produced. Um, yeah, uh, uh, Jay Shields did uh, the amazing cover art, um, and he did uh, the design for um, American Eagle's costume. That's our lead protagonist uh, on the front. He's a um, he's a military veteran, uh, firefighter, married father of two from Freedom, Nebraska, who uh, develops superpowers when he's saving children from a burning building. And becomes a superhero and um you know he's a you know patriotic uh family man and the plot twist is that he's actually a patriotic family man <laughs> like you know yeah. he's actually a good dude mm -hmm. which is subversive in today's environment where everyone is expecting you know that uh your heroes are actually terrible human beings and it's like no he, he's actually what he appears to be he's a good he's a good dude mm -hmm. so um so he's he's becomes the the main leader of the star spangled squadron but the RPG at the time that the RPG takes place, he's left planet Earth for reasons unknown, and so there's a, a massive power vacuum as the world's greatest defender is absent, um, which is purposeful uh, as a setup for the RPG because I think you know it's sort of like no fun to be in the world of Conan if you're not Conan. Right. So likewise, like you know, remove uh, I, I've removed the most powerful element from the game so that the players can shine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's there's always a weird element of you know running a game in the Marvel universe where you're playing a team of superheroes who aren't the Avengers, uh, but yeah, the Avengers exactly. are, they're around, they're somewhere. Uh, yeah. So you guys, you guys are mighty, but you're not Earth's mightiest heroes. They're still, you know, over there. And you want your players to be the center of attention. You want right. them to be kind of the, you know, the baddest, the baddest guys on the block. Uh, so, you know, finding ways around, there's someone more powerful than you out there, uh, but you know, in in the case of your book, you know he he's off planet. He's he's gone at this point. Uh, th that's an interesting idea because you know if he comes back, you know what what what'll happen when he comes back and runs into the players? Exactly, exactly, and and it's left it's left open. The um the you know the backstory of the game ends with a cliffhanger, but basically. Uh, you know, quote, the world's smartest man develops his own space plane, flies off to the dark side of the moon on an adventure, and then the space plane crashes and he's vanished and nobody knows what's happened. And um, the world is going to hell. Exodus attacks Washington, D.C., and there's a massive battle. Most of the Star Spangled Squadron are casualties. Um, and then uh, and then American Eagle leaves uh, for space for reasons unknown. And that's where the, that's that's the beginning of the uh, sort of official campaign setting. So, and then the the graphic novel is explaining some of the is is essentially a prequel to the role playing game. So the graphic novel explains how did we get here, and so it's the origin of American Eagle, the origin of Manicor, the origin of Exodus, you know, the or uh, etc. Um, and I would like to say for the record that unlike 
creators of multi-billion dollar media franchises. Um, I actually worked out everything in advance for about a five-year period. <laughs> and so uh, I am not making it up as I go along. Mm. And um, and it will not be the case that three different directors will go in totally different directions <laughs> with each installation. Uh, there is, there is in fact, a plan. I just <laughs> lay that out there. That, that's actually my criteria for judging Hollywood movies is did the director put more time thinking it through than I did for Friday's Dungeons and Dragons game? And mm-hmm. if the answer is no, then they suck. But but Alex, don't you understand it's a mystery box and you don't know what's inside the mystery box. <laughs> yeah. And it's it's only a real mystery if you yourself, the designer of the mystery, have no idea what's inside that box. <laughs> like, look, again, far be it for me to criticize people who are more successful than myself. I will say that I personally do not ascribe to that philosophy. It drives me crazy. So if I make a mystery box, I know what's in the box. Yeah, I mean, half of the fun of a mystery is being able to figure it out. And the people who write mysteries professionally now, or at least purport to, hate the idea that uh, someone could possibly unravel the work they've done and, you know, come to the conclusion before they, the all-powerful writer, want them to. Yep. And there was, there's a very distinct point in history where I think, you know, this becomes a problem. And it's uh, Armageddon 2001, I think, was the story in DC Comics when everyone figured out who Monarch was mm. before uh, that issue came out and then they changed it. See, it's just so wrong. Everyone, so wrong. It, it leaked online, or everyone figured out. I don't know which one that it was going to be Captain Adam, and so they changed it so it was Hawk. So you know, I mean, I have some sympathy for the creators, right? Like mm. it used to be the case that your fan base was in relative isolation, and so you know, if you didn't, if if you know, Bob the reader didn't figure it out, it wasn't like he was going to go online and have everyone else tell him. And if one person did figure it out. He was just a dude sitting in his living room being like, I figured it out, but he had really no way to tell anyone. Nowadays, one guy figures it out in the middle of, you know, uh, Boise, Idaho, and next thing you know, it's front page of Reddit and everyone on the planet knows the spoilers. I get it. It sucks. I think at the same time, like, you have to be authentic to your own created material. There's this um, amazing quote by J.R.R. Tolkien where a fan sends him a letter uh, with a question um, about orcs or something and tolkien's response is he's like you know what a good question i must find out (laughs) yeah in other words like middle earth exists separately from him and he has to find out the answer by meditating on it you know and just you can just tell like he took the world so seriously that he felt there was a right answer that he had to find out and that's the kind of a creator i aspire to be Mm. um uh in terms of the seriousness with which i try and take my world building and um, so, it, you know, it kind of it definitely irks me as a consumer of entertainment that that's not the way it's done anymore. But what can you do? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's this weird, this weird misbegotten offspring of we don't want anyone guessing what we have planned before we reveal it to them with the uh, the M. Night Shyamalan desire of there has to be a twist. It doesn't have to make sense. There just has to be a twist. Right. Right. Yep. Like, you know, this this uh, lionization of the idea of subverting expectations. I'm not trying to subvert people's expectations. I'd like to meet their expectations. I'd like to exceed their expectations. I'm not trying to subvert their expectations. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and having expectations is not a bad thing as a consumer. You know, it's it's always fun when a neat little surprise comes along and you're like, I was not, you know, I wasn't expecting this to be what it was, but this is cool, but not everything can be that. Right. That's right. You know, and then there are also expectations of how things, uh, how to put it. There's plot expectations and then there's emotional expectations. And I think it's good to have, you know, your occasional plot twists, but I think it's it's wrong when you try and subvert the emotional experience, right? Like if I go to see a horror movie, I want to be horrified. Yep. And if I go see a horror movie and you end up giving me a uh, lifetime tearjerker, 
you know, you've subverted my expectations and I'm also going to give you a one star review because I don't like lifetime tear jerkers, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah. Anyway, hmm. now we're, we're, we're on, we're on a rant now. What else oh, yeah. can we rant about? <laughs> I mean, just kind of based on, you know, what you've said and, uh, you know, the influences that you've cited so far, I I have to ask, uh, do you watch uh, The Fourth Age on YouTube, Uh, RJ? No, no, I do not. Uh, So, so RJ, the the creator of that, it's, it's a comics focused uh, YouTube channel. So at this point, we're we're well afield of RPGs, but he talks about comic book storytelling and how it mirrors or how it should mirror uh, mythology and how, uh, you know, superheroes, th- there's an archetypal hero. There's a lot of kind of, uh, you know, Joseph Campbell to what he's talking about, but there's also, you know, an, an appeal to the, you know, Greek philosophers. And essentially what he gets to is there is, there is a right way to tell stories that there is an expectation that we all have that's largely going unfulfilled because, stories have to resonate with us as human beings. Yes. And if they don't, if they're just creating some kind of artificial reality that doesn't scan with what we experience to be true or what we know to be true, it feels inauthentic. And you can't just keep pushing that, telling people that this is the reality because it doesn't match what we, even if we deny it, know is real in our in our hearts and our minds. I, I couldn't agree more with that. I'll have to check that out because I, I'm 100% in agreement with that philosophy. Yeah, I'll shoot you a link once we're uh, once we're off the air here. Yeah, awesome. That sounds great. And he's it's also to... oh he he's also uh, you know cr- he's putting his money where his mouth is. He he's uh, created a uh, a graphic novel of his own. So it, it's cool that people who are thinking about things like this, like like he is and like you are, uh, are actually not just saying on the internet, you know, this is crap and this is why it's crap, but also here's something that I think is better that strikes more at the heart of what I think the issue is and does things the way that I think they should be done. And I hope you guys agree with me. Exactly. I think it's really important, um, you know, to be more than just a critic of pop culture. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, you know, the, People who are dissatisfied, as you say, they should put their money where their mouth is and they should offer up what they think things should be. And in my case, I thought that should be a logarithmic game system with um, sexy, violent image comic style art. And apparently there was a need for that. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the tack I took on um, how comics fit into the world and the mythic archetypes in Ascendant so I have these you know, people developing superpowers, and I thought to myself, what would happen if people developed superpowers in our real world right now? You know, and if you think about zombie movies, nowadays, anytime a zombie movie happens, zombie movies themselves are such a common trope that people in a zombie movie would know that they were up against zombies yeah. and act accordingly. And so I thought to myself, if people started developing superpowers in the real world, there would be an expectation that they would act like superheroes or supervillains. And so, um, you know, one of the one of the aspects of the setting is that the U.S. military purposefully puts all of its um, U.S. military superheroes in costumes with code names and presents them as a superhero team because the American public feels a lot more at ease with that, whereas, you know, if you just like, this is a guy who's a mental sniper who can kill people from a thousand miles away with his mind, that's terrifying, right? But if you say, this is Dr. X-Ray, and you put him in a goofy outfit, then everybody's like, that's awesome. I love Dr. X-Ray. I follow him on Instagram. <laughs> and, um, and so, you know, and, um, and, you know, the costumes are, you know, purposefully kind of over the top so that uh, in the setting, people will argue about the costumes on the internet rather than be stressing about the fact like, oh my God, there are humans of mass destruction that <laughs> could kill us all, uh, because that's terrifying to think about. Mm-hmm. And so it, the, the formal word for that is hyperstition, which is when a superstition actually creates the reality um, that it purports to be. So the game, essentially superheroes become real hyperstitionally. Mm-hmm. And that's a trope I play with a lot um, and, and have a lot of fun with. Yeah. And also the superheroes all work for the Coast Guard 
because a, wa a policy wonk in the White House figures out that it's the only branch of the military that can both fight crime in domestically and also work overseas without mm -hmm. violating posse comitatus. And so overnight, <laughs> yeah, which is true, by the way, it's the yeah. only branch. But overnight, the Coast Guard becomes the most prestigious branch of the U.S. military as a result. <laughs> and it gets a huge budget. And it's and I, find, I you know, I find that uh, hilarious. Mm -hmm. um, so. Yeah, a lot of people don't. A lot of people think of the Coast Guard and they, I guess, think of like that Ashton Kutcher movie, The Guardian, or just, you know, think, oh, they're the, they're the boat people who aren't as cool as the Navy. But exactly when, yeah. when you think about what the Coast Guard actually does uh, for the most part in the real world, the Coast Guard are the ones who are responding to uh, the Somali pirate thing that was happening several years ago. They're the ones who are uh, like stopping ships in the water that are carrying drugs from Colombia. That's right. that's what the Coast Guard does day in and day out besides just uh like rescue ships that have called for distress. So Exactly. Th there is exactly. an element of law enforcement to what the Coast Guard does. So that's I got to say that's brilliant. Yeah, so I was really surprised when I dug into it cuz I I discovered the legal loophole that they're allowed to bypass posse comitatus. Uh, while also being an armed service. So I actually dove into it and I was really surprised. Like, you know, the Coast Guard actually has like elite special forces troops and they have all these, you know, really awesome emergency response teams and, they, and you know, they're constantly active fighting crime. And um, so, so, yeah, so the uh, all the superheroes work for the Coast Guard. It's the mm -hmm. best, best branch of the U.S. military. <laughs> Now, I, I have to say as a Rothbardian anarchist that uh, horrifies and terrifies me, but, you know, Again, it, it's a really interesting thing that you're playing with there. Well, and I leave, you know, in, in the game, it's left very open for interpretation. Mm -hmm. um, you can interpret the Star Spangled Squadron as the good guys, like they're yeah. patriots that are trying to make America a better place. You can also interpret it as a, um, you know, a, as essentially a pretty terrifying thing where they're using propaganda and superhero aesthetics to disguise, you know, this humans of mass destruction. And, you know, and I feel like as a game designer, I'm offering a sandbox. I'm not yep. here to tell you what your worldview should be. And, you know, uh, people should go at it and have fun and explore whatever they think makes sense. I've tried to set up, you know, I've tried to set up a world that I think is plausible and entertaining um, and that passes a sniff test. Uh, and, you know, folks can have fun with it however they'd like. Mm hmm yeah, and to, to get back into the kind of realm of RPGs and to call back to what we were talking about earlier, this is the watchmaker thing. You, you've you set the pieces, you've set the world in motion, the, the gears are turning, and it's all about now how the players are reacting to what happens as each gear turns and each, you know, mechanism fires off. Exactly, exactly. You know, and the game is set up like you could play the Star Spangled Squadron, but there's also a provision, there's a private police forces have developed that have superhero superhero cops um i have a whole thing about how states start passing laws to legalize vigilantism um it's very funny because in the game i have this whole thing like states pass laws to legalize vigilantism um and the law that's that i use in the book is actually an existing law in texas where it's already been legalized <laughs> and um <laughs> like well of course it has it's texas um so uh as a superhero you might end up just getting to be a texan <laughs> And I don't know if you remember uh, some years back that whole phenomenon of the like real life superheroes, guys like Phoenix Ew. Jones. Yep. That yep. came about because Washington State is a mutual combat state. So he would right. he was going out and he was challenging criminals to fights with police as referees because that's how the law played out in Washington. So he was patrolling the streets of Seattle legally just because it's not illegal to wear a stupid outfit, and in Seattle, I, it's not illegal to challenge someone to a fight and then beat them up if they accept. Right, mutual combat, which we need, frankly, in oh, every yeah. state. Absolutely. I mean, we're bringing it back. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I, I, would, I would love to have real-world superheroes wandering around. That would be so fun. Just mm -hmm. be like, what's up, Phoenix Jones? <laughs> now, yep. he, he turned out to... to be kind of a scumbag but other than that it, it's a cool idea uh, did he i you know like it was a huge thing like 10 years ago right yeah oh about, yeah oh yeah and then it just vanished from the map um so i don't know i don't know whatever happened i remember the stories but it's too bad he turned out to be a bad guy 
he got into some trouble. He he burns the bridges within that community. There's a documentary, like an hour and a half long documentary on YouTube about him, uh, which is fascinating. But he burned some bridges in that community, and he got a little bit excessive with people who actually weren't committing any crimes, including like uh, pepper spraying some dude who was just like leaving a club and was slightly drunk. Uh, that's yeah. Well, you know, great power corrupts, man. Yeah. You know. Oh yeah. His, super, his superpowers got too strong. Mm-hmm. Acton, Lord Acton's law applies in, in all scales. So, you know, there's that. Yes. Yes. yes it does. It does. So this has been an absolutely fascinating uh, conversation that's gone in multiple different directions. This is the most I've talked about philosophy on the show in quite some time. So I, I appreciate, uh, you know, you oh. kind of bringing that to the table here. Uh, my pleasure. Uh, absolute blast. I, you know, I came into it. I didn't know you were a, uh, uh, a Rothbardian anarchist. We, we could have talked libertarian <laughs> stuff all night long, but probably for the best, we stuck to comics. Mm hmm. Oh. Absolutely, and and we can talk about we can talk about libertarian stuff at any time. So that's right, that's right. Yeah, the audience is here for the games and comics. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so what I like to do at the end of the show is just kind of turn it over to you to you know tell everyone where they can find you, all the stuff that you have available. Obviously, you know this is on drive through. It's print and uh, PDF. Uh, so just you know tell everyone where they can find all things Ascendant and all things Autark. Awesome. All right, so. Uh, you can find the game at drivethroughrpg.com. It's currently the number one bestseller, knock on wood. Um, you can also find the game at Autark Emporium, which is uh, autarkemporium.com. That's our company store. If you want to check out the crowdfunding campaign, it's at indiegogo.com slash project slash ascendant star spangled squadron. Uh, I'll provide these links to you afterwards. Um, and then you can also check out my company website, which is autark.co. We've got a Patreon for folks that are uh, really interested in the games we produce um, and want sneak previews and things like that. I hope uh, folks will check out the game. I hope they'll check out the graphic novel. Um, it's been uh, uh, you know, a real surprise to find out uh, how welcoming um, the comic book RPG uh, crowd has been. Absolutely. And uh, just as we're wrapping up here, thank you to uh, Radagast42 for the follow. I greatly appreciate that. Uh, you know, thank you for everyone, Quantum Moron, Radagast in the chat, uh, you know, for, for uh, you know, contributing. I, I greatly appreciate uh, you guys leaving comments. All that engagement is great, and I love it. Um, as we're kind of wrapping up here, just to let everyone know what's going on, uh, next week... Uh, James from Valor Studios is going to be on to talk about his D&D show. Also next week, uh, we've got some big announcements about the future of Roland Bones. Uh, James will be on here to hear about it. Uh, so there's there's big things coming next week. There's big things this week as well, because, you know, we're, we're talking about uh, the number one game on Drive-Thru RPG, but th there's more coming in 2022 for Rolling Bones that I hope you guys will uh, will stick with me for because I'm excited about it and I hope you guys will be too. So uh, once again, Alex, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, like I said, Thanks next week... Oh, absolutely. Next week, uh, James Kurzweil will be on uh, to talk about what's going on with Valor Studios. Uh, so until then, guys, whether you rolled a 1 or a 20, I am so glad that you rolled your bones with me, Ryan Howard, and I will see you next time.